Welcome back to another episode of Revealed Apologetics. I'm your host, Eli Ayala, and today uh, we have a very exciting episode. We're going to be covering the uh, issue of uh, young earth creationism. I know folks are very interested in discussions uh, with regards to um, the debates surrounding creation, the different interpretations and understanding young earth, old earth, these sorts of things. Um, and of course, they have a lot of application for apologetical issues. So uh, hopefully this uh, episode will be very, very um, useful to folks who are interested in these sorts of discussions. And it's very important as well, uh, since uh, we're talking about foundational issues. I mean, the book of Genesis is uh, a foundational book that uh, the rest of scripture kind of uh, refers back to as as uh, so important in understanding uh, doctrines that are uh, more developed throughout the rest of scripture. So these are very important issues. All right, well, more specifically, we're going to be dealing with um, biblical objections to the young earth uh, interpretation, um, and we are going to specifically be responding to a video that um, was put out by Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy, um, and he is a very well-known um, YouTube apologist. I mean, he's got a very large uh, following. He puts out some great, some great content um, with regards to covering um, all sorts of issues. If, I mean, if you're familiar with his his web, not his website really, but his YouTube channel, he covers a wide range of topics that a lot of people uh, benefit from. I've I've had Michael Jones on the show before to talk about um, uh, tactics and debate and things like that. And so there's this is nothing against uh, Mike. But at the same time, I think it's important to have a clear voice and response in defense of the other position that is being criticized. The young earth position has a very strong uh, history and there have been able uh, defenders of that position. And so um, I thought it would be a great idea to have someone like Jason Lyle, uh, who most who listen to this channel are familiar with, to have him on and provide some responses. So here's what uh, here's how things are going to go. OK. I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Lyle in just a moment here, but then we're going to be playing uh, the video that was put out by Inspiring Philosophy, and then Dr. Lyle is going to take some time to uh, respond to each of the points, all right? And these are biblical objections, all right? So I think uh, Michael Jones does a good job in really focusing in on what's important. There, these, there are discussions of science that are brought in usually in these debates, but really, as Christians, we, we want to be faithful to scripture and we want to know what the Bible says. And so um, I do appreciate that Michael tries to zero in on uh, the text of scripture. And while I personally disagree with uh, with Mike's um, conclusions, um, you know, this is a good um, launching pad for a good discussion. OK, so all that in mind, let me introduce uh, Dr. Lyle. And uh, there is Dr. Lyle. Hello, Dr. Lyle. How are you doing? I'm I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I've been busy, but it's all good. We've got some snow over here. It's clearing up, and then we're going to get some more snow. So, all right, all right. I'm from Colorado, so I'm used to snow. Where Where are you from? Well, I'm I'm now living in Colorado Springs, so it's we get snow here quite often, especially. Okay. This all right. All right. We get all the ground up in the mountains. It's quite quite lovely. Okay. All right. Well, um, for those of you who don't know who Dr. Lyle is, I'm just going to read a little bit of his information that can be located on his website, Biblical Science Institute, which I highly recommend folks to uh, visit if you're interested in uh, young earth creationism, science and apologetics, presuppositional apologetics. I mean, he's written a couple of books, just a couple. I mean, you know, this is a really good book to help you to think clearly and logically. Um, he also has uh, this fine book that addresses um, apparent biblical contradictions, uh, Keeping Faith in the Age of Reason. And um, a book that I just got finished recommending to someone who was trying to look into Introduction to Logic. I was like, I have a good idea. Here, this is an Introduction to Logic by uh, Dr. Lyle. So very good book. It's got pictures and everything. If you don't like to just read, uh, you know, boring, dry words on the screen, uh, he does a very good job in, uh, you know, explaining these issues, these complex issues and simplifying them. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Jason Lyle is a Christian astrophysicist who researches issues pertaining to science and the Christian faith. He is a popular speaker and author. Dr. Lyle presents a rational defense of a literal genesis showing how science confirms the history recorded in the Bible. Brought up in a Christian family at a young age, he received Christ as Lord. Since then, Lyle has always desired to serve the Lord out of love and gratitude for salvation and to spread the gospel message to all. Dr. Lyle is double majored in physics and astronomy. Uh, with a minor in mathematics at Ohio Wesleyan University. He then went on to obtain a master's degree and PhD in astrophysics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. There he used the SOHO spacecraft to analyze the surface of the sun and made a number of interesting discoveries, including the detection of giant cell boundaries. 
Since then, Lyle has worked in full-time apologetics ministry, and he wrote a number of planetarium shows for the Creation Museum, including the popular Created Cosmos. Dr. Lyle has authored a number of best-selling books on the topic of creation, including Taking Back Astronomy, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, The Ultimate Proof of Creation, which is probably his more uh, popular book, and uh, Understanding Genesis. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the back info on Dr. Lyle, and you can follow his information there on YouTube and on his website, Biblical Science Institute. All right. Before we get started, is there anything you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Lyle? Some interesting piece of information <laughs> that, that I missed? No, I mean, that, you, you covered it pretty well. I just I just hope people will check out. If they'll check out that website, they'll learn everything that, that I know because <laughs> it's all on there. That's right. Okay, very good. So uh, let's jump right in. I'm going to... Uh, plop the video there and we're going to play this video and uh, Dr. Lyle you can just let me know when we should stop or I will stop when I think it's a good time to stop if you don't say anything and uh, and okay. we'll take it from there okay uh, just for context here um, uh, he does not argue for it but Michael Jones I believe holds to the theistic evolutionary position which is the view that God used evolution and so he holds to um an interpretation of Genesis that is very much in line with someone like John Walton who I just previously had on my show um, so if you're interested in what uh, John Walton um, says with regards to how to understand Genesis, that's kind of, I mean, he might have some differences, but that's kind of where uh, Michael Jones is coming from. And so just to create that context, and of course, Dr. Lyle, it holds to a, a young earth, um, we would say a literal interpretation, right? Of course, we want to explain what that means, but well, why don't we explain what that means first? Now, let's get that out of the way. When we speak of interpreting Genesis literally, what do we mean by that, Dr. Lyle? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's going to be an issue in this in this video. Mm -hmm. uh, I I've kind of gone away from saying that because a lot of people the, the word literal when you talk about reading something literally you just mean in its plain and ordinary sense. Sure. Uh, but some people take that to mean oh you mean every word has to be taken in its in its the first dictionary definition. No, that's not really what we mean. Uh, biblical creationists like myself interpret the Bible literarily, I think would be a better way to put it, which means we we, uh, we read the text and we take it at face value unless there is a contextual reason to take it otherwise. Okay. And in some places there are contextual reasons to take it otherwise. And so I don't take the Psalms literally when, you know, when the Bible says there's no rock like our God, it doesn't mean, I don't, it doesn't mean that God is basalt. Uh, it, you know, it, it, we understand that as a metaphor and we would expect that in the poetic literature. That makes sense. What we want to avoid is looking at a text that makes sense in the plain text, but it's contrary to what we've been taught. And so we think, well, it can't mean that because then I'd be wrong about, well, maybe you are wrong about whatever. Uh, so we want, to, we want to read the Bible exegetically, looking at its text, interpreting according to its own standard. And, and that includes looking at the way Jesus interpreted the scriptures, looking at the way the apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament interpreted the scriptures when they're penning the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain rules of hermeneutics, and I, and I have written a book on this called Understanding Genesis. Uh, basically, we read the Bible the way we would read really any other book in the sense of we, we use the grammatical historical context to understand the author's intention. What is the, tr what is the author trying to say? That's what we want to get at. Mm -hmm. And that implies taking a text in a plain fashion unless there are contextual reasons to take it otherwise. Okay. Would you also understand interpreting the Bible liter, liter or maybe this is what you said, but kind of I'm putting it in my own words just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding. To interpret the Bible literally is to basically interpret it in accordance with its literature. So that would include genre and all those other considerations, cultural background, contextual background, things like that. Yeah, and to avoid any confusion, I don't even say that I read the Bible literally because I, 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 people think that means a wooden literal sense. I, I like to say I read the Bible literarily. I okay. take it according to the type of literature that we're looking at. I interpret it according to its context. Mm -hmm. and so, and by the way, that is that's the normal position for biblical creationists like myself. My friends at Answers in Genesis would take that position too. And okay. so our, our critic here is going to argue against the position that we don't exactly hold to because he's going to he, he seems to think that. We take everything in a wooden literal sense. And that's not the case. We use context to determine the meaning. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump right into this and put this up back on the screen here. And uh, I'm going to play it from the beginning. And then you just let me know when we should stop. If you haven't heard, there are millions of people today who believe the Earth is only about 6,000 years old. And about 4,000 years ago, there was a worldwide flood that destroyed all life on land except for a few people and two every animal 
that survived in an ark. The basis of this theory comes from many who say we ought to take a literal or plain reading of the Bible, the holy book of Christianity. The rationale behind this young earth view is that they are just taking the plain reading of the text and that Christians who believe the earth is old have to misconstrue or reinterpret passages to make the Bible fit with an ancient earth and the theory of evolution. But what many young earth creationists don't realize is that there are several passages within the Bible itself that create problems for the young earth theory. Meaning if we took the plain reading of the text in many places, it would actually contradict the view that the earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old. These are the top 10 biblical passages that create problems for the young earth theory. Number 10, Genesis 17, 17. Genesis recounts the story of Abraham and Sarah, who were old in age and had no children of their own. God appears to Abraham and says he will have a son in his old age. And then in Genesis 17 it reads, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? So Abraham thinks it's biologically impossible for someone past the age of 100 to have a child. But this seems to contradict the ages of his ancestors, also known as the early patriarchs. Why don't we go ahead and stop We're supposed to live for hundreds of years. Okay. So, already we have some problems here. Um, okay, so yeah, Genesis 17, 17, 17, where God promises to give Abraham, by his wife, Sarah, a, uh, a child. And Abraham laughs and asks, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And, and will Sarah, who is 90 years old, uh, bear a child? And a, a couple things there. First of all, in, in my view, and I think a lot of scholars will hold this view, his laugh is a laugh of joy. I don't think he's doubting what God says. Abraham had faith in God. Now, when, when Sarah laughed, it was a laugh of doubt. And she's criticized for it. Abraham's never criticized for, the, for his laughing. He's laughing out of joy. He's going to get a son. And he knows it's unusual. So our, our critic here says that Abraham thinks it's biologically impossible for someone past the age of 100 to have a child. The text doesn't say that. It, it, it implies that Abraham thinks it's amazing that he's overjoyed that it's going to happen. But he knows that with God, all things are possible. He's not, he knows that's not an issue. And mm -hmm. it could be, too, that it's, it's not just him being 100 years old, but rather his wife being 90 years old, whom he also mentions. He's not just a 100-year-old man. He's a 100-year-old man married to a 90-year-old woman. And that's all the more spectacular because even in our day, men can remain fertile into their older ages, but mm -hmm. women, once they pass menopause, then that's it. And so that that might be the, the thing that's exciting to Abraham is that his wife, who is apparently past menopause, God's going to give her a child. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. there's no uh, there's no doubt there. But it does seem unusual. And our, our critic says, but this seems to contradict the ages of his ancestors. No. A contradiction is A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. Abraham did not live at the same time as those people who lived, for example, before the flood. Uh, well, one of them, Shem, overlaps a little bit. But the rest of them, they were gone. Uh, it, it was very common before the flood. It was common at that time for children to be born to 100-year-old uh, parents because people before the flood lived to be typically around 900 years, in excess of 900 years. Mm -hmm. So the, the entire um, lifespan, our lifespan was much greater back then. And there are various scientific theories on that, but we don't have to get into that. So yeah. it was common before the flood for people to give uh, birth to a child that was, if they were even, if they were elderly, if they were 100 years or older. But it was very uncommon at the time of Abraham. In fact, uh, we, with the possible exception of Abraham's father, and we'll, we'll come back to that, okay. the last time that it happened, was almost 400 years earlier. That was the last time anybody who was 100 years old, as far as we can tell from the text, mm -hmm. anybody who was 100 years old, it would have been Shem. So the last time that happened, again, with the possible exception of Abraham's father, what would have been with uh, Abraham's great, 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 great grandfather. And so I think it's entirely <laughs> for Abraham to say, wow, this hasn't happened in quite a while. So uh, why don't we continue? there and uh, unless you have any comments on that nope nope that's good we'll move it along here i'm gonna make sure we get through it there we go and have children in their old ages according to the masoretic dates many of abraham's ancestors 
were supposed to be alive when God made his promise to Abraham in his 100th year. And his ancestor Eber supposedly outlived him. So shouldn't Abraham's reply to God have been that many people alive are having children in their old ages? So having a child at the age of 100 is perfectly normal. More importantly is the fact that based on what Genesis 12 says, Abraham's own father, Terah, would have had to have fathered Abraham at his own age of 130. Okay, let's stop so it shouldn't there. Abraham's reply to God have been that having a... Okay. For Craig saying, uh, so shouldn't Abraham's reply to God have been that many people are alive or having children in their old ages? Well, no, they weren't. Not, not at that time. Mm -hmm. the, the last one to do that, again, with the possible exception of Abraham's own father, the last person to do that was, was Shem, and he was, he was dead at that point. He was alive okay. when Abraham was born, but he died at that, before that point. So no, nobody alive at that time was having uh, children at the age of 100. Now, he does mention uh, Abraham's own father. Uh, I don't think that's, that's fatal to, the, to the, uh, the, the plain reading of the text, though, because it would just be one exception. It'd be like, wow, that, 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 that is still extraordinary. That's the only time that's happened in the last 390 years was with my own father. So that's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. But even then, we don't have any information on, on Mrs. Tira. And as I, as I pointed out earlier, it might be more that Sarah being, you know, he's, Abraham's not just a 100-year-old man. He's a 100-year-old man married to a 90-year-old woman who's presumably past menopause. Uh, so Tira, hypothetically, uh, might have been married to a younger woman where it wasn't so extraordinary. Somebody who hadn't hit, uh, he might have been married to a young hottie for all we know. Yeah. And, you know, so that's, that's a possibility there. But I think, and this is something that we need to think about. Uh, a lot of, there are scholars who would agree with our critic here that, that Abraham was born when Tira was 130. But that's not clearly specified in the text. Uh, that's, in fact, Genesis 12 doesn't say that. Um, let's see. It's um, looking at some. I have some notes here that Perfect. I jumped down. Yeah. So the the assumption is that Abraham left Haran at the time of Tira's death, and that comes from two assumptions that are. The first is that the beginning of the next chapter happens immediately after the events of the previous chapter. But we know the Bible doesn't always do that. Uh, the book of Judges, for example, is not in chronological order. Some of the events that happen at the that are recorded at the end happened earlier than events that that were recorded earlier and so on. And so the same thing is true here. And also, I think because of a misunderstanding of Acts 7-4, people think that that uh, Abraham left Haran at the time that um, that Tira died. But if you look at it in the original Greek text, which I've done, Acts 7, 4, it most naturally means that when Tira died, Abraham moved Tira's body from Haran to have him buried in Canaan, where Abraham had already been living for 60 years. Mm -hmm. If you just look at X, if you just look, pardon me, if you just look at Genesis uh, 11, 26, that seems to indicate that Tira was 70 years old when Abraham was born. And I think that's the more natural interpretation. Not everyone would agree with me. Sure. Uh, like I said, even if even if he were 130, that would still be one miraculous exception uh, mm -hmm. of, of now too. So it's not, and I, th I think it's important to keep in mind too that even even if what you're saying is not necessarily correct, the very fact that it's possible means that there's not a problem in the text. It just means now w which view are you going to adopt? You yeah. have a different. You have certain options to choose from interpretively to make sense out of that. It's not necessary. I mean, you might think, well, that's just unreasonable. Well, I mean, you could say that, but that is a possible interpretation. So therefore, there's not a necessary conflict there. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Should we continue? Sure. All right. A child past the age of 100 is perfectly normal. After all, his own father had him when he was 130. The whole episode in Genesis 17 implies Abraham didn't know of anyone, his own father included, who had a child past the age of 100. And this would imply that when Genesis assigns high ages to the patriarchs, it is probably not their literal ages, but symbolic numbers for theological messaging. And that would mean Genesis doesn't give us a literal chronology back to the creation of Adam, damaging the young earth creationist view that the Bible documents through the ages of the patriarchs that the earth is only 6,000 years old. For a better understanding of the symbolic view of the ages of the patriarchs, see our video on Genesis 5. Okay, let's pause Number it there. Number 9, Genesis 8. All right, yeah, I would imagine you want to mention 
something about those ages being kind of a, what do you say, metaphorical or symbolic or something? Yeah. Well, first of all, it doesn't follow from what we from what was mentioned previously. I mean, he's, he's welcome to speculate on why Abraham thought it was unusual or or amazing to have a child of a hundred, but we've seen from the text that makes perfect sense because nobody was having children at that time, at the time of Abraham in their hundredth year, with the one possible exception of Abraham's father. And I've shown from the text, even that's probably not an exception. He was probably seventy when Abraham uh, was uh, was born. So there's no problem there. It makes perfect sense that Abraham would say, "Hey, at this time, in this time in history, uh, you know, it's, that's very unusual." And, it, and so it's really kind of a silly argument. It's be like if we found if we if we found a uh, the tomb of a pharaoh and found that he was encased with a Toyota Camry, you know, the, the pharaoh had a Camry. That's amazing. You can imagine someone saying, "That's not all that spectacular. I've got a Camry." Something can be spectacular at one time and quite commonplace at another time. Mm-hmm. And that's what we, we see here in the text. So so there's no there's no there's not even remotely any suggestion that the ages are anything other than literal ages. Uh, we don't take our our speculations about why a person responded that way and then use that to say, therefore, I'm going to interpret this text as non-literal. He says the numbers may be symbolic. Of course, the question I would ask is, what does it symbolize? Right? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times people will use that as, as an excuse for, I don't want to believe this text is written, so it's symbolic. Mm-hmm. But if it's symbolic, you better know what it symbolizes. Tell me what it what they mean. And I don't they don't mean they, they mean the age right i mean it's just it's just they're recording the normal age you see if we're doing exegesis if we're doing hermeneutics if we're looking at the text then we would say well the given the style you know frequent use of the law of consecutive and genesis is recording historical narrative therefore we ought to take it as literal history unless there's a certain phrase or something that's often used as a metaphor which we can learn from other you know the other sections of the scriptures but but in, in genesis it's just it's historical narrative and therefore we we take it that way I don't believe the Bible is some kind of Gnostic document with secret codes built into the numbers like that, that denies the perspicuity of scripture. The Bible is meant to be understood uh, by us common folks. You don't need to have a PhD in astrophysics to understand it, which I do anyway, but you don't need that. To <laughs> for everybody, for I have one, but you don't need one. <laughs> because it's, it's written to be understood. Now it does, it does pay to go back and look at the original language as I respect that. That's great. The other thing too, it's kind of interesting is if he's right and those ages are stretched out because they're mm-hmm. metaphorical, guess what? That would make the age of the earth even younger than 6,000 years. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, if start, yeah, if you say, well, those are symbolic, they were actually regular age as well, then that just makes the earth even younger than 6,000 years. So that, now, that's your thing. Now I have a question. So, so um, if, if I know Michael Jones and I've listened to his debates, he becomes very prepared. He's very well researched, even though we might disagree with his understandings. I would imagine if if you were to say, um, you know, well, what do those ages represent? He would probably try and provide some examples in ancient Near Eastern texts. Are there examples within the ancient Near Eastern uh, context where ages are exaggerated to make some kind of point? Oh, I think that that happens. But the thing is, the Bible is not just it's not just an ancient Near Eastern text. It's the word of God. And God Mm -hmm. doesn't lie. The pagan cultures lied. They made up myths about how the world began. And it's very common for people to say, well, see, the Bible's like that. God didn't want them to be fooled by these other myths. So he wrote his own myth. I'm thinking that doesn't make any sense. You can't counter fiction with fiction. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you you can't say, well, you don't believe these fictional stories. So I'm going to make up another fictional story about how the universe began. That's not that's not what Genesis is. Even even in its own text, that's what not what it says is. These are the generations of Adam. These are the, or the book of the generations of Adam. These are the generations of heaven and earth, the birth things. This is what happened. And you find that that Toledoth throughout Genesis indicating this is what happened. This is what followed. And so its own text indicates that it's historical narrative. It's not, God's not going to exaggerate um, a, a factual account to make a point. He's not going to do that. Now, in metaphorical literature, sure. In, in poetic literature, in Psalms, you can use hyperbole. That's fine. In the, in the parables of Jesus, you can use hyperbole. That's fine. For recording facts, you don't do that. It's called lying. <laughs> God's not going to do that. Well, what if someone says, well, God's just speaking to them in the way that they could understand, you know, kind of this accommodation view. God is accommodating his language and categories to uh, relate to that ancient context. Well, I think he actually is, but he's not going to do it in a way that's untruthful. Uh, God does st- come down to our level to help us to understand things, but he's not going to lie about it. Mm-hmm. He might simplify some things and then 
as the as we get greater revelation, we get more clarity on those things. That's fine. We do that with children. We say, you know, you're all made of these little atoms, and they're like little balls. Well, they're not exactly like little balls, but that's a good approximation until they grow a little older. And you say, well, now that you're in a physics class, let me tell you, here's the true nature of atoms. They they're actually wave functions that break down when you look at it, and so on. Uh, the language is meant for us to understand, but it's not going to be a lie. Okay, it's not going to be something where I, I get to heaven and well, God, you said Methuselah lived to be 969, and I I know he's only 72. What you lied? I mean, that's not that's not going to work. God does speak to our level, but he doesn't do it by distorting something, by lying to us, by taking something and making it false. Now, now wouldn't they say then that he's not lying? It's just that in the ancient context, they would have understood it. And it's our job as modern readers to put ourselves in the shoes of that ancient context so that we're understanding what was originally meant. Well, the, the, the seductive thing about that is there's some truth to it. Because I do believe we should look at the mm. radical historical context, key, key historical, that's part of it. But mm -hmm. how do we know what the ancient world believed? We, we do have other documents, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, how, do, you know, how do we know those are true and so on? How, how do we know these other documents are authentic? What's the most authentic document of the ancient world? I'm sure you know the answer to this. Yes, the Bible. It is, exactly. <laughs> so it's the Bible that we use to learn how people uh, understood the Bible. And when we look at the other texts of the Bible, we find that uh, they interpret texts like Genesis literally. And now, the, in fact, God warned the Israelites. Occasionally, they would go off into one of these pagan ways of thinking, and God punished them for doing that. He says, you're not to be like these pagan nations. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, that Genesis is written to help the Israelites be like pagan nations, but with a different myth, that's contrary to what the Bible itself teaches. The Israelites were to be separate. They were to be an example for the way everyone should be. They weren't to go follow after myths, uh, fables. They were they were to tell the truth. They were to tell, you know, it, but but yeah, there is something to that. There is something to the fact that we we look to see how people understood things at the time. But the Bible tells us how people understood things at the time. So that's the primary source that we should use when interpreting the scriptures. Hmm. All right, let's continue. A common view among young earth believers is the idea that the earth was covered in a global flood about 4,000 years ago. When Genesis records that God flooded the earth, it should be understood as literally the entire globe because it says the waters covered the face of the whole earth. But there is a problem for this view within Genesis 8. Verses 4 and 5 say the ark came the rest in the mountains of Ararat or Uratu, and the tops of the mountains could be seen at this point. However, later in the chapter, Noah releases a dove and it returns to him because the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. But didn't verse 5 say the tops of the mountains were seen? So verse 9 cannot mean the waters were literally covering the whole earth, implying the entire flood account might be hyperbolic in its description of the flood. And this would mean it was not literally covering the entire globe, but just a regional area. This is also supported by verse 13, where it says the waters dried from the earth. But this obviously cannot literally mean the entire globe, since most of the surface of the earth is still covered by water. So it appears the flood account is describing the flood hyperbolically and doesn't necessarily teach the entire globe was covered. Number eight, Genesis 2.24. All right. Go back and hit some of these. Um... He says that we, young earth creationists, uh, claim that the flood was global because the text says the waters, he, he, he cites Genesis 8, 9, the okay. water is still on the face of the whole earth. That's um, that's when the flood's receding. That's not the verse that we would use. Uh, it would be more like passages like Genesis 7, 19 through 20, where the text says that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters proceeded upward, the mountains were covered. Every creeping thing died. Everything that was on the you know the face of the earth died, and and so on and so forth. So, so that certainly indicates a global flood, and frankly, the entire account of of the ark <laughs> mitigates against the local flood. Why would you build an ark the size of an ocean liner, take two of every breathing every air breathing land animal, including birds, for a local flood that you knew was coming? Why mm -hmm. not just move? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to flood this section. Okay, I'm going to go over there. Thank you, Lord, for that warning. 
Uh, <laughs> there'd be no point in taking animals on board the ark because animals would just, they'd repopulate the area. They come from these yeah. surrounding areas. Uh, you certainly wouldn't need birds uh, for, a, for a local flood. Birds can get away just fine. There are birds that migrate every year from Alaska to Hawaii. And of course, there's no land in between. They have to, that's how far they can go under certain conditions. Mm. And so, you know, there, there'd be no, there'd be no sense in taking birds on board an ark for a local flood. It just makes no sense. So the entire passage indicates a global flood. And of course, if you, if you know something about the Hebrew language, the double use of coal, when it says, you know, that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, actually all in whole are the same word in Hebrew, they're coal. And when you have it doubled like that, it's for emphasis. I mean, I really mean everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like God's going out of its way to say, boy, it's, it's global, the entire earth, everything that's on the earth, everything under the under the heavens, that means under the sky, everything on the earth died. It's, the text is really is pretty clear. Now, the critic seems to have some confusion about the uh, recession of the flood. He, he mentions in Genesis 8, 5, that the uh, on the 10th month of the flood, since the initiation of the flood, the, the tops of the mountains were visible. That's right. But by the way, that only works with a global flood. A local flood is not going to cover mountains. It just doesn't. Water seeks yeah. to rubble. So that doesn't, that wouldn't make sense. And then later on, the dove was sent out, but returned because she found the resting place for the water was on the surface of the earth. Now, the Hebrew word there, just on, al, it's alpine, uh, the surface of the earth. And um, that's different from Genesis 7, 19, where the mountains were covered. There's a difference between being covered by water and just water being on something. You okay. can you know, you fill a cup, there's water on the table, but it's not covered <laughs> by water. There is a difference. And, uh, and just context would indicate that as well. So Genesis 8, 5 uh, indicates that the surface of the earth was still wet. It still had water on it everywhere. It was muddy. And ravens don't care about that so much. They, are, they can feed on carrion, at least today. And they're a robust bird. Uh, doves are more, gent more gentle. They're a gentler variety of bird. And so no one knew what he was doing. He released the raven first, and it, it goes back and forth. And, but then the, the dove he sends out, and she doesn't want to land on that mud, so she comes back in. It makes sense. It wasn't until a week later that she finally finds the olive branch, and then he sends her out again, and then she's gone. So it actually makes sense. The land was still in the process of drying. And so we need to be careful about things like that, because people make the same kind of mistake with the, uh, the, the tree that Jesus cursed, and immediately it withered, and then it comes back the next day, and they, and they were surprised that it had withered because you can wither immediately to some extent and then wither more to another extent. I mean, that, that makes mm -hmm. sense. The earth can be dry in the sense that the waters are not covering uh, the mountains anymore, and yet still the surface can still be wet. Mm -hmm. So that's, that would be the more natural, um, I think so, that would be the more natural meaning. So to simplify, he's saying that young earth creationists who also believe in a global flood will say on the one hand that the Bible says that the whole globe was covered. Yet there is a passage in scripture which says the mountains, the tip of the mountains were showing. And so he's trying to show that there's a conflict there. So how might we summarize that briefly, kind of just saying, well, wait, that's not a contradiction because. Well, that would, I don't think that's, if I, if I understood his argument, that's not exactly what he's saying. But if he had made that argument, that would be fallacious. Okay. He's looking at two different times. It's okay. in Genesis 7 where we see the, the oncoming of the flood, where we see the mountains were covered. It's in Genesis 8. Genesis 8 is 10 months Later, when the tops of the tops of the mountains are visible, it's during the recession stage. Okay. So it makes perfect sense in light of a global flood. It doesn't make sense in light of a local flood. Local floods do not cover mountains, and that should be obvious. They just don't do that. And people want to whistle well, the Mesopotamia Valley, which is it, well, it's open on the south. You can't flood it anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it flows. You know, I, I looked at the elevation. You, you can check on Google Earth. You can look at the elevation. You can't flood that area because the water just rushes out. You know, I and mean, you can flood it a little bit, but not not very much. It's certainly not going to last a year, so okay. it makes perfectly it makes perfect sense the way that it's worded. Um, he says that it he's, because he sees because he can't make sense of a particular text. He says, well, therefore the the entire flood might be hyperbolic. Uh, no, it just means you need to do your homework a little bit more. You need to go back and look at the language and make sure that you're understanding it right. I, I don't I don't I would reject this sort of hermeneutic that uh, if I see a text I don't understand, then it's all. Uh, metaphorical. No, you need to go back and do your homework a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I think he would probably say that it's reasonable to conclude that it's metaphorical because it's probably consistent with how, what how ancient Near Eastern literature looked like. I mean, as he sees it, based on his own, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I would say, but it really isn't. 
Um, <laughs> it, it really I, 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 now, this is something I've looked at because I've had a, I had a class on um, uh, myth, legend, and folklore when I was okay. And I really enjoyed the class. It was really interesting. We got to look at some of the other flood legends because there are flood legends around the world that are derived from the biblical event. But they don't they don't have the internal logic that the Bible has because the Bible's recording real history. And okay. so these other, you know, these other stories that are passed down that are not passed down by the by the inspiration of God, they're not preserved by by God. They get distorted. You have the you know um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and he meets uh, uh, Noah Utnapitnam in uh, in that uh, particular story. And his but his arc is a cube, which of course it doesn't make hydraulic sense because the cube, you know, <laughs> the, the, the arc that God designed is a real arc. It's a real boat. It makes sense. So we have every indication, and, and more importantly than any of that. Um, this is written in the same style, frequent use of Vav consecutive, and this happened and that happened and that happened. As Exodus, as Leviticus, Deuteronomy, these other sections of history where God is recording things that happened. And so Dr. Stephen Boyd, for example, who is a PhD in Hebrew, mm -hmm. who studied this, he says there's no doubt that they're recording literal history in these sections of the Bible, just based on the Hebrew verb form that's used, the frequent use of the Vav consecutive. You don't have that in poetry. You might have an individual Bob consecutive or two, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you have more of the Bob disjunctive and other other forms of speech. So there's no doubt from the text that this is referring to a global flood. And then one other point I wanted to address here, because he says that um, uh, it can't literally mean the entire globe, because it says the waters are you know off the earth. Well, that that uh, that's why it doesn't say the whole earth. It doesn't say kol uh, haaretz. It's just they're off the earth. Because Eretz, uh, the word Eretz can mean it can mean the planet Earth, it can mean land, and so it's obviously the land that the water is off of, and not the yeah. entire planet. Yes, yes, the Earth is still uh, two thirds covered with water, a little more than that actually. So uh, that's not a problem. And then I'd also point out too that Jesus referred back to the flood as a literal event. Mm -hmm. uh, he warned people on that. He's, you know, just like the days of uh, Noah, where people were eating and drinking, and then sudden destruction. You know, he's, that's what's going to be like. And I, I, nobody, as far as I know, nobody said, oh, but that was just a metaphor. So you're saying the upcoming judgment's just metaphorical, so I don't have to repent. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody interpreted it that way. He was talking about real history that happened and it is like, in some sense, a judgment that's going to happen. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, let's continue. Young Earth creationists are often proud of the fact and almost go so far as to brag that they just take the play reading of scripture and don't have to reinterpret anything. In my debate with Ken Hoven, I asked if he takes all of Genesis 1 and 2 literally, and he replied, I have a question for Ken on Genesis 2. Do you take the entire chapter of Genesis 2 literally? Absolutely. But this is actually impossible, because Genesis 2.24 cannot be understood literally. After Adam is introduced to Eve, it reads, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Since married couples are not sewn together, this obviously cannot be understood as literal. Some young earth believers try to get around this by saying it's a reference to procreation in the act of making children. But that would mean they interpret the phrase becoming one flesh metaphorically to mean having offspring, since the text does not literally say to make children. Verse 24 is obviously metaphorical language, but that means the text of Genesis 1 and 2 could also be using other metaphors. It was not meant to be entirely literal. Number seven, Genesis 3.22. All right. Yeah. When I heard that, I was kind of like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> what do you got to say about that? Yeah, some, some problems there, some problems there. Uh, we, we, we go back to that original uh, confusion on what do we mean when we talk about reading the Bible literally. Okay. And uh, no disrespect to Kent Hoven, but he, he's probably not the, the spokesman for uh, the highest quality uh, creation research that's out there. I would recommend my peers at Answers in Genesis, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we would say that we would read the Bible literarily, including Genesis 2. Uh, Genesis 2 does, the, the Bible has poetry in it. And even Genesis, even Genesis 2 has a little poetic section because you'll, you might notice in verse, I think it's verse 23, I don't have it up in front of me. Uh, when, when Adam sees his wife for the first time, he breaks into poetry and who can blame him? And he said, you know, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He's using that Hebrew parallelism there. Now the Bible's recording that, what Adam literally said. So it's still literal history, but, it, but what Adam says is poetic. And then there's some 
debate about is is verse 24 still quoting at it because of course we don't have quotation marks in the original text uh, i'm not sure that it, it, it is point. but in any case um it, you know our, our our critic here has said that uh, it can't be understood literally well that would a couple errors here a couple errors first of all he's assuming that the hebrew word translated flesh which is bizarre has exactly the same semantic range as our english word for flesh but it, it really doesn't there's overlap uh, and so you can't say, well, this can't be, be taken literally if you don't know what the literal meaning is. Mm -hmm. And so I looked it up. I looked at different references for the as that occurs in Scripture. It's actually related to the Hebrew word meaning to bear, as in to bear news, okay. which I think is interesting. Isaiah 61, 1, it's the same uh, consonal, the triconsonal structure. And First, uh, first uh, Chronicles 10, 9 uses to, to bear news. It's the similar word. It's a related word. Now, and it makes sense that it be related, because usually if Hebrew words, if they have the same consonants, but just different vowel pointings, they're usually, there's similarity there in the meaning between the verb and noun and so on. Okay. Uh, fleshly creatures bear offspring. So it's, it makes sense, like to bear news would be similar to, would be relating to fleshly creatures who bear offspring. It makes sense. It's a possible explanation anyway. And in human beings, that takes two, two to do that. So what, what is the range then of, of the star? It can mean skin. It can mean your physical body. It can mean meat, like eating meat. It can also mean a close relative, which is interesting. And it, it's used that way a number of times, uh, for, especially when it's used when you use bone and flesh together, or flesh and bone together. That often means a close relative. And it's used that way in Genesis 29, 14, 37, 27, 2 Samuel 19, 12 through 13, 1 Chronicles 1, 11, and so on. And even the word itself, flesh, can mean relative, sure. family. And it's used that way in Leviticus 18.6, where that word is translated relative, a blood relative. Uh, yeah, it's that word. It's a blood, your blood flesh, actually. And so it, that's one of the that's in the range of the meaning of the word is relative or family. Mm -hmm. And if we if we understand that, we say, you know, does that fit the context of Genesis 2? And you shall be one family. It really does. I mean, you know, so that that is within the range of the meaning of the word. Uh, but but. And it's also interesting, too, because even the word one in Hebrew, in, in this instance, is ikad, which it can just mean one, but it can also mean something that's one in one sense and more than one in another sense. And it's the same word that's used for God in the in the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, uh, Yahweh Echad, God is, our God is one. Mm -hmm. But we know that God is triune. He's one in one sense. He's three in another sense. He's one being yeah. persons. Yeah. And so we have that, that same word is used. It's used in Genesis for day, the first day, day one, because it has two parts. It has a day part and a night part, but it's one day. And so here we have we have something that's two flesh and yet also one flesh in another sense. So it's very fitting uh, to take it as written. But even if we say, okay, but that's a little bit, that's a less common usage. Okay. Uh, can we take that a little bit metaphorically? Okay. But then again, my argument is not that we should take all the text of scripture uh, in a wood literal fashion. We take right, it, we read it in a natural sense. And the natural sense is that Adam and Eve form a family unit. That's what the verse is indicating, which isn't within the range of the word. And the fact, and again, you have the, you have the, um, the fallacy of composition, just because one section of a text contains poetry, because verse, although verse 24, I would argue probably doesn't, verse 23 does. That doesn't mean that the rest of it is poetic or to be taken mm -hmm. up on literal fashion. Mm -hmm. You can have little bits of poetic sections in an otherwise historical narrative. In Exodus, we have a whole, almost a chapter where um, uh, after they cross the Red Sea, they sing a song about it, and the song is poetic. I mean, it's literally recording what they sang, but the song itself is poetic. So you can have poetry Im embedded in historical narrative. We take the text in a natural sense, and the natural sense there I think is pretty clear. I don't think we need to uh, go into much detail on that. All right, very good. I'm gonna keep my comments to minimal so that we have time to get through everything because uh, I think you're doing a great job. I appreciate it, Aaron. Let's keep going. Genesis 3 recounts the fall of Adam and Eve in the exile from the Garden of Eden. Young Earth creationists believe before this there was no death because God made everything perfect. So Adam and Eve would have had to have been created immortal and the fall resulted in their bodies being made mortal and consequently, death came as a result. However, Genesis 3 never says their bodies were changed or transformed to be mortal. God curses the ground, but never places any curse on their bodies. In fact, all he does is bar them from the tree of life. Verse 22 reads, Then the Lord God said, 
Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. The implication numerous scholars have pointed out is that Adam and Eve were already mortal, and the only way they obtained immortality in the garden was eating continuously from the tree of life. To make them mortal again, all God had to do was prevent access to this sacred tree. But that means humans were already mortal before the fall and were only granted immortality through a special fruit, not because they were created with immortal bodies. This is also supported by the fact that Adam is called dust, which is an idiom in the Bible to denote that one is mortal. In Genesis, it might just be metaphorical language to denote that he was a mortal human, meaning Adam was mortal before the fall, which implies that death was a possibility before sin entered. Number six, Genesis 2-4. All right. So he starts by saying, young earth creationists believe before this, before the fall, that there was no death because God made everything perfect. Well, it's for more reasons than that. We know that God saw everything he'd made. Behold, it was very good, according to Genesis uh, one thirty one. And when you consider what God's standard of goodness is, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And by the way, if you know something about the Hebrew language and you look up what filthy rags means, it's not it's not a compliment. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, yeah, you've looked it up, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so if you think about that, God's standard, and God looks at it and says, it's very good, then I think we can trust it's very good. And it's not just that, though. We look at other passages like 1 Corinthians 15, which states that the first man brought death into the world. By, by man came death, and that it is an enemy. So is God going to call the world very good if it's got an enemy? And it's something that God himself calls an enemy, an enemy that will be destroyed. Mm. And the last enemy that will be destroyed, in fact. And likewise, Romans 5, 12, by one man came sin and through sin, death, because death is the penalty for sin. And of course, that leads into Romans 8, which indicates the, the entire creation is now groaning under this bondage of corruption. It awaits to be delivered from that bondage of corruption. So the over the over all theme of scripture is that the world was indeed very good by God's high standard when it was first created. There was no sin in it. There was no death in it. Death was an enemy that was introduced at the, as the right punishment for Adam's sin. That includes animal death. The first animal death that's recorded, it's, it's kind of between the lines, but God provides skins of clothing for Adam and Eve after they sinned. Those are animal skins, which means God sacrificed an animal or animals to provide clothing for them. And then uh, shortly after that, apparently people sacrificed uh, animals to God as a, they, I think they understood something of the gospel. They understood something about substitutionary atonement that that God was covering our sin uh, by sacrificing an animal that doesn't deserve it. That foreshadows Christ. So again, this comes back to it. It really comes back to a gospel issue that, that death being the penalty for sin. That's rather important to the gospel, and that's why this is uh, important. How, so, how how are we to understand where it says that through Adam's sin, uh, death came to all men? So t typically they make the argument that, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe sin entered in for the first time through Adam, but the text doesn't seem to say that. It says that death came to all men. How would you navigate that that point of contention there? Say that one more time. I don't think I quite understood. Yeah, when, when it says uh, in Romans where it says that through Adam, death came to all men. Mm -hmm. So they would say, yeah, may maybe death came through Adam, but the text doesn't seem to imply that that include necessarily animals. It says that death came to all men. Gotcha. So it's kind of specifically dealing with, with human death as being the thing that God considers an enemy, not necessarily the death of animals, which men are to be, to use for their, you know, for their own purposes, to the glory of God, things like that. How would you respond to that? I think if you only had that section of scripture, five, 12, and maybe a couple of verses beyond that, okay. uh, 12 itself just says death through sin. It doesn't restrict it to men, but then later, yes, death came to all men. I get that. Okay. Uh, if you just had that section, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know if if it was if it if it propagated to the rest of creation or not. I think when you once you continue on that, Paul continues that line of reasoning through Romans eight, and Romans eight indicates that all creation was subjected to futility because of because of that one man Adam, mm. and so his sin wasn't it didn't just affect mankind; it affected all creation. We would expect that because we understand something about federal headship. We understand something about when someone is given dominion, when they, when they have authority and they sin, all the people under their authority experience some of the consequences of that sin. 
Uh, a lot of people are upset about our new president because he's done some, he's already done a lot of things that are un unfortunate. And guess what? We got to suffer the consequences of that because he is in authority over us at this time. And that's something mm -hmm. that God has ordained, whether it's a form of judgment or I think it is a form of judgment. But in any case, um, yeah, so we understand that. But the other thing to remember, too, is God called everything very good when it originally. Uh, do you know we find things like cancer and arthritis in fossils that evolutionists believe to be millions of years old before Adam? Because we all agree human beings don't go back 100 million years. So if you're going to have disease in the world, animals suffering from disease, that's I think that's inconsistent with very good. And it's inconsistent with the fact that God, apparently God instituted animal death at the result of the fall. That's the first time we see an animal being sacrificed. Now, I'll grant it. I'll grant that doesn't prove it. Absolutely. But the fact that the first time we see anything about animal sacrifice, it's after Adam's sin and as a result of Adam's sin, where God provides clothing uh, to cover them. So I think the, the overall message of Scripture, it, it doesn't go in and give us a lot of details on animals because that's not the point of the Scripture. It's mainly sure. for us and our relationship with God. But God does care about animals, too. He says, say, uh, in, in the Proverbs, it says, a righteous man regards the life of his beast. So if you mistreat your animals, if you torture them, you're not a righteous person. That is not something God approves of. And it seems inconsistent that God would not apply his, his own standard to himself. God does care about animals. They do suffer, but it's a result of our sin and not because God is cruel. God didn't create animals to suffer and die. We did that. Mm -hmm. And that is the necessary consequence of us having authority over creation. Okay. All right. Great. Let's move along there. Let me uh, actually, let me see if there's anything more I want to say there. I, I did want to point sure. out too, because he goes into, you know, he says the fall resulted in their bodies being made moral. Consequently, death came as a result of it being our position. He says, however, Genesis three never says their bodies were changed or transformed to be mortal. Uh, he says, God curses the ground, but never places any curse upon their bodies. I would encourage him to tell that to a woman in labor. <laughs> Genesis 3.16, God greatly increases the pain in childbirth. So something changed there. He changed something about the female anatomy, that birth would be painful now, apparently. Um, it could be a very small change. We don't know. But uh, and then in and then Genesis 3.19, he says to Adam, dust you are, dust you shall return. That sounds to me like, hey, you're mortal now, Bubba. And, and of course, this was after. <laughs> this was after sin. So there is, there is a change. God doesn't have to come out and give the details on how he did it. But he, did, he, is, he is saying, uh, you're going to you're going to die now. The, um, he says that all he does is bar them from the tree of life. He says the implication numerous scholars have pointed out is Adam and Eve were already mortal. Uh, no, I would say they were created immortal and would have remained immortal unless they sinned because that's that's the clear teaching of Scripture. Um, well, if they were if they were created immortal, then what's the what's the point of the tree then? Since it seems to suggest that the immortality is based upon having access to that tree. Okay, two possibilities. One is, like he said, and there are scholars that believe that, that the tree was the means by which God granted immortality to Adam and Eve. That's okay. I don't hold that position, but I admit that's a possibility. I think the more likely position is that the tree, although it's a literal tree, it represents closeness with God. And, the, and of course, our immortality really comes from God. And you can find that throughout the scriptures, that God alone is the one who gives us eternal life. Uh, he, 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 and, of course, he gives that authority to the Son. The Father gives that to the Son to grant eternal life to all whom he wishes. So the tree represented that closeness, that um, fellowship that we have with God that was unbroken by sin. And we're now barred from that uh, as a result of the curse. But the interesting thing is we read in, um, in Revelation there will be a time where we will again eat from the tree of life because we will have unrestricted access to God, unburdened by our, our sin nature. So I, I'm inclined to think that's what it what it means but in any case what you know even granting uh, his interpretation of that god ordains not only the ends but the means and so if the tree was the means by which god granted them eternal life that's fine I, I i see his point but i don't think it's right because animals originally would have been immortal as well because again animal death instituted after adam sin and many animals would have been on the other side of the globe perhaps or we think the continents were different then but they'd have been far away and not had access to the tree of life so mm -hmm. i think it's more likely that I don't believe that the tree, the tree of life, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, had any kind of special properties, magical properties in the, in and of themselves. They represented either faithful commitment to God or or disobedience to God, depending on which one you choose. Okay, because I could see how people could find that confusing. It seems like the tree there is connected to immortality. I think it is by virtue of the fact that it's connected to God. It represents the uh, unbroken fellowship of God, and that's 
who ultimately gives us eternal life as God. Okay, I see. I see what you mean. Okay, all right, let's continue. Very good. Young Earth creationists often argue that Genesis 2 is a recap of what takes place on day 6 within Genesis 1, when God made humans. But Genesis 2-4 poses a problem for suggesting this chapter is a recap. The verse begins with, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is what scholars call a toledoth, and it is used throughout Genesis, almost like chapter markers for the ancient audience. However, when this phrase is used, it always introduces what comes after the person or the generations that follow him. It is never used to denote a recap of something that happened prior to this. Biblical scholar John Walton notes that the phrase in Genesis 2 is probably teaching the same idea and that what takes place in Genesis 2 is meant to be a sequel, pause not there. a recap sure. of what happens in Genesis 1. There's a lot there. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to nitpick over words. I wouldn't call Genesis 2 a recap. Uh, I would I would say beginning in verse 4. Verse 4 is a transition point, Genesis 2-4, uh, to the next account, which is a more detailed description of the events of day 6. I, I think When I think of a recap, I think of a short summary. It's actually expanding on it. So okay. Genesis, 1, Genesis 1 gives us the brief outline of what happens on each of the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest. Genesis 2 is an account that gives a more expanded description of the events of day 6. Now, how do I know that? Exegetically, because I know human beings are made on day 6, according to Genesis 1. And Genesis 2 is describing the creation of those first humans. And we'll come, because you're going to say some more things here that we'll come back to. But that's exegetically, that's why I would interpret it that way. It was just based on the context, okay? Because Genesis 1, human beings are made on day 6. Genesis 2 says, here's here's how human beings are made. So that must be a more detailed account of uh, day 6. Now we have the this, this phrase, um, these are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created. Uh, and that word generations is toledot. And it's probably its most literal translation would be birthings. But it, it indicates what follows afterward, what happens. Um, and it does it does describe what happens as a consequence of what was previously mentioned. But in Genesis 2, 4, what was previously mentioned was the creation of the heavens and the earth, okay? So what follows then would be something that happened after that. A, 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 what, what are the birthings? What, are, what, is, what is the history that resulted from God created heaven and, heaven and earth? And one of those was the creation of human beings on uh, day six. So there's no inconsistency there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so it's so again, birth things are more generally what follows, and there are others of these tool adults that describe what happened after Adam as the birth things of Adam, uh, Shem, Isaac, and so on. And uh, so Genesis two four is the only one where it's used with a non human. It's used with heavens and earth to indicate what 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 was a result of their birth. What did they birth? What did they lead to? What was their history? Mm -hmm. And so it gives the details of what happened after God created heaven and earth. But that was on day one that he created heaven and earth. So the events of day six did happen after that. Again, I think our critic is assuming that that the Bible never backs up and describes something in more detail. But that is simply not true. Mm -hmm. There are many cases where that happens, including in the Toledoths. Um, He says it's never used to, to recap, to denote a recap of something that happened prior to this. I actually agree because I don't think Genesis 2-4 is a recap. It's an expanded account of what happened on day six. Uh, so maybe a little bit of a straw man fallacy there. But uh, Genesis 2-4 is beginning a new section describing that history. Uh, our critic seems to think that um, the text following the Toledo can never cover an event that was addressed previously or in a previous chapter. That is wrong. And we see an example of that even in Genesis. In Genesis, um, let's see, it's in chapter, I wrote this down, chapter um, 10, verse 1, lists the generations of the Toledo of the sons of Noah, and beginning in verse 22, it gives the sons of Shem. Shem had this person all the way down to his uh, great grandson. Then in Genesis 11:10, it backs up and says, here's the Toledoth of Shem. And again gives the descendants of Shem, this time in greater detail, giving the numbers associated with them. Mm-hmm. So the Toledoth in, in Genesis 11 gives information that was already recorded in Genesis chapter 10. So that the Bible can do that. And we, we find the same thing in Genesis uh, too far. We have a total adult saying, here's the birthings of heaven and earth. And although it was briefly mentioned in the previous chapter that God made human beings, 
uh, Genesis 2 gives us a much more de detailed account of it. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Let's go. After God establishes the cosmos, he then hones in on one region on the earth to create a garden environment. But this would mean what is commonly viewed as the creation of the first man in Genesis 2 is not actually the creation of the first man. Since in the prequel to Genesis 2, God elects all humans to be his image, and this would take place before Genesis 2 and before Adam is believed to have been created from dust. Scholars like Michael Heiser know Genesis 1 speaks of encompassing all of humanity, not just one man or one couple, implying when God made man in his image, it was meant to include all humans, wherever they were existing at that time. Then Genesis 2 picks up after this with the creation or election of two specific individuals to act as priests in the Garden of Eden. So because of the Toledoth in Genesis 2, the implication is Adam came after when all humanity was made in the image of God, and therefore was not the first human. Number five, there Jeremiah is. 4, over there. 20. All right. Uh, Genesis 2, I would say it's not really a recap or a sequel. It's a detailed account of the events of day six, uh, which had been briefly mentioned in the previous chapter. And that's that's consistent with the other use of the word Toledoth, like we saw in Genesis uh, 10 and then again in verse 11, where it backs up and talks about what happened in the previous chapter. God can do that. That was That's actually pretty common in scripture. So that's not a problem there at all. Okay. Um, and Genesis 2 is describing the creation of the first man and the first woman because God, uh, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That's what the Bible says. So she's she's the mother of all human beings. And uh, let's see what else was like to point out there. The um, So he says that Genesis 1 is referring to the creation of lots of humans, not just two. And then Genesis 2 picks up after that with creation or election. I noticed that of two specific individuals. That's not what Genesis 2 is about. God creating man from the dust of the ground. It's not an election. He's not saying, you you two come out of this group. I'm going to elect you as priests. That's not what the text says. God made Adam from the dust of the ground. It's talking about his formation. And then he made Eve from his side. And in fact, that is the basis for marriage. And so if that didn't really happen, we have no basis for marriage. If that's just a metaphor, we mm -hmm. don't have a basis for, for biblical marriage. It's, it's not linked in history. And the interesting thing, too, is in Matthew 19, 4 through 5, Jesus quotes... Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24 back to back as if they're referring to the same people. He refers to the create God making humans in his own image, male and female. He created them. That's from Genesis 1.27. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his mother and, and, and or father and mother and cleave unto his wife until he'll be one flesh. So Jesus was under the impression that the same people mentioned in Genesis 1.27 are the same two people mentioned in Genesis 2.24. So if, uh, if Walton's right, then that means Jesus is wrong, and we've got we got some issues there. So that's going to be a problem. <laughs> okay. So so now, d don't some theistic evolutionists suggest something that there were um, <clears throat> other people in existence, but when God chose Adam and Eve and breathed into them the you know the uh, giving them a soul, that in that sense, that's God electing them to be the first quote humans. Because what makes man human is is really the image of God, right? Um, yeah, there are people that yeah, there are people that say that. It's just it's just you can't you can't work that into the scriptures, right? The, uh, you know, because he says Adam, you know, Adam may have not been the first human, but what does Paul say in First Corinthians fifteen forty five mm -hmm. that the first man Adam became a living soul? So he, he was the first he was the first person, mm -hmm. and um, the first human being. We're all descended from them. So uh, the Bible is pretty clear that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings, and they really were made the way. That uh, that God says again. Adam calls his wife named Eve because she's the mother of all living, as Genesis three twenty. So I, I, you really have to twist the scriptures to try to fit the the uh, traditions of men in this instance. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Let's continue. Three to twenty six. Young Earth creationists often assert that Genesis one cannot be read to mean anything other than a literal six day creation of the cosmos. When theistic evolutionists interpret it to mean something else, they are reading that into the text. But it seems the prophet Jeremiah used very similar language from Genesis 1 to metaphorically describe the fallen northern kingdom of Israel. In Jeremiah 4, the prophet is warning Judah that they will be desolated like the northern kingdom if they do not repent. And in doing so, he described what happened in northern Israel 
by heavily borrowing from Genesis 1. He says northern Israel is now formless and void. There is no light, no man, no birds of the air, and no vegetation. Even the very conservative scholar John MacArthur acknowledges the language was taken from Genesis 1 and is used in reverse to speak of what happened in northern Israel. But this language does not mean the fabric of space-time opened up and sucked out the land of the northern kingdom. The sun was still literally shining on the region. There were still humans, and there is no reason to believe birds refused to fly over the area or that no plants grew. Jeremiah is simply using this language to metaphorically say the northern kingdom no longer functions properly. But if the same language is used in reverse in Genesis 1, that implies all it is saying is God took a disordered cosmos and made it function properly for human civilizations to begin. Thus, within the scriptures itself, the implication is the language of Genesis 1 does not mean literal material creation and therefore does not necessarily refer to a literal six-day creation. Okay, let's pause that. Four. Genesis 1. Four. It's, it seems to me that he is v very much relying upon John Walton's work with regards yeah. to the, the issue is not material creation at all. It's assigning function to things that are already there. Yeah. And so what, what it seems like he's trying to do is he's trying to find wiggle space in the text so as to open up the possibility that this is what might actually be happening, in mm -hmm. which case you're then, if it's not about material creation, you can fit in a couple of other understandings, perhaps theistic evolution or something else. I mean, I, I'm not saying that he's doing that in some nefarious way, but it seems that that sort of interpretation seems to lend towards that um, that understanding, in my opinion. But oh, what, yeah, what I agree. yeah, I agree. And that's, that's pretty common um, among the old earth creationists, among the theistic evolutionists, you know, mm -hmm. because, it's, and it's not what we do as biblical creationists. We don't say, well, you know, the scriptures could mean this or that. We're saying, you know, the, reading the text here, this is pretty much what it's got to be. We use logic and we use hermeneutics to figure out what God is actually saying, rather than all the other possibilities that God might be saying that he actually isn't in the text. Uh, now, this is a, this is another example, too. I think of the, the overarching fallacy of, hey, the Bible uses metaphor in poetic passages. Therefore, the historical narratives can be metaphorical. Mm -hmm. No, that that. Is, that doesn't follow logically. It's a non sequitur. Uh, Jeremiah being a prophetic passage, it's written in poetic uh, form. That's pretty much always the case with Hebrew prophecy. They're always written in poetic form. And you can recognize that by parallelism. And uh, maybe we should cover this just briefly, unless your sure. audience is already aware of this. But, um, it's, it, you know, the um, Jeremiah 4.23, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. So you see that parallel there. You have uh, earth going going along with heavens. Those are often mentioned together, heaven and earth. And you have formless and void, and no light, darkness. Okay. So those two things go together. Whenever you have that, that's an indication that you're dealing with a poetic passage. And the key to interpreting uh, poetic literature is to understand what the two things have in common. And that that's the point of the passage. And so, for example, uh, Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Okay, that's parallelism because you have the heavens declare the glory of God. Sky, heavens and sky go together. Uh, his glory, the work of his hands, those go together because the work of his hands reflects his glory. And so the way you interpret that is you say, well, the heavens are saying something about what what God's glory through through what they do through 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 creation. Mm -hmm. That's how you interpret it. And of course, Jeremiah, it's it's a prophetic passage. It's written in that same poetic form. Uh, you can find that throughout the passage. You, you can see the the, um, the parallels there. And one common feature of poetry is hyperbole. Perfectly acceptable, where you exaggerate something to make a powerful point. Perfectly acceptable in poetry. Not acceptable if you're recording for regular history, because you want to, you, if you're recording facts, you want to get the facts as they are. But if you're making an analogy, that's fine to use to use hyperbole. And that's what Jeremiah is doing. And the interesting thing is our, our critic actually got the first part of his argument there pretty much right. I think he's right about that. Um, it, it, the the um, Jeremiah is borrowing uh, language from Genesis. And um, you know, so he says, I looked on the earth and behold, it was formless and void to the heavens and they had no light. Um, that was actually the literal conditions of the heaven and earth. The first instant before God created light, before he formed and filled the earth. And Jeremiah, what he's doing is he's metaphorically describing the destruction that happened to Israel and would happen to Judah if they didn't repent. 
using hyperbole, saying God is basically going to uncreate. He's going to destroy you so so massively that it's like he's uncreating the universe. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is it only works if Genesis is real history. Because if Genesis didn't really happen, if it's just, you know, if it itself is a metaphor and, Jer's, and Jeremiah is saying, what's well, going to be like reversing that event that never actually happened? Then, oh, good, I don't need to repent then because that never actually happened. And so this, mm. this destruction is not going to happen, even, even in an exaggerated sense. Uh, he says, but this language, the critic says, but this language does not mean that the fabric of space time opened up and sucked out the land and ignored the kingdom. Right. It's, it's poetic and it's written that way. And we know that because of the parallelism. Which you do not see in Genesis. You don't have that. Well, so the claim to, to parallelism is not an arbitrary, oh, look, you're not interpreting it literally. Like, no, no, no. There is evidence within the text that there is Hebrew poetry being used to make that point. Right. Okay. And it, the neat thing is, it's very easy to see parallelism in Hebrew. Very easy. And it's one of those wonderful, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful illustration of the fact that God's sovereign over history, that he used the Hebrew language to record the Old Testament of the Bible. Because if he used a language like English, in our poetry, we focus on rhyme and meter, and when you translate that, it's lost. The beauty is lost. But with parallelism, it transfers into other languages, and I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, we to interpret this passage, we, we look at what the two couplets have in common. The um, In this case, severe destruction. That's, that's the implication of the passage. Okay. And uh, he says if the same language is used in Genesis, and he implies, well, then it too can be metaphorical. Uh, well, no, it's not really the same language in the same style, I mean, but they're both Hebrew, but it's not using the same style. Genesis does not have that that uh, poetic parallelism. We don't see it, neither synonymous nor antithetical. Again, you might have an individual verse, like when Adam sees his wife and he, he breaks out in poetry, that's fine, but you don't find that consistent use of it throughout Genesis. Sure. And I should point out too that metaphors only work if there's an anchor point, right? If I say uh, a literal anchor point, if I say Joe is a real bear when he first wakes up, we understand that metaphor because we understand the disposition of a literal bear. <laughs> we, we get that. <laughs> now, would it be logical to say, oh, so well, if Joe, if Joe being a bear is metaphorical, then maybe the bears themselves are metaphorical. They're not real animals. They're just metaphors representing Joe. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it doesn't go backwards. The mm -hmm. metaphor depends on the real thing in order for it to make sense. Sure. So Jeremiah is referring back to the literal history of, of Genesis, but in reverse, to metaphorically describe massive destruction. Mm. All right, very good. 14 and 19. The most popular objection used against young earth creationism is the fact that nights and days exist before the sun, which is created on day four. Days and nights cannot exist without the earth rotating and moving around the sun. Young earth believers often reply by suggesting maybe there was another light source, or they will argue that God made the light on day one and then gathered it together into the sun on day four. But this seems unlikely since Genesis 1 talks about the sun and the moon being created together as lights, and the composition of the moon is not the same as the sun. You cannot gather light together to make the moon. It only reflects the light from the sun. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's because I'm an astronomer, but this, this one's going to take a little time here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I hear this one a lot too. You know, you well, can't but, but see, but this is this is why I think having you on is helpful because sure. you can deal with the text, but you're also a scientist, so you can speak with knowledge in that area. And a lot of people, they're either scientists who have little knowledge in the text, or they're very textual, but they don't really know the science. So um, sure. that's good. Yes, you are a you are an astrophysicist, <laughs> so perhaps you could share your, your thoughts here. Well, in, in as mistakes in astronomy, I guess they bother me a little more than they would other people. But in any case, <laughs> okay. so his claim is that nights and days exist before the sun, which is created on day four. Uh, that's true. But he says days and nights cannot exist with the earth rotating and moving, without the earth rotating and moving around the sun. That is not true. All you need for day and night is to have a rotating planet and a light source. It doesn't have to be the sun. If there was a planet orbiting around a quasar, as long as the planet's rotating, it'll have day and night, even though a quasar is not the sun. It's a different light source. You just need a light source and a rotating planet, you'll have day and night. Was there a light source for the first three days? Yes, there was. The Bible tells us that, Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness, called the light day, the darkness night, evening and morning were the first day. So the earth's already rotating there on day one. It's no problem with God creating light initially. Uh, you, you can speculate all you want as to what 
kind of source God used or whether God himself just sort of supernaturally created the light. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it does tell us that God originally provided the light for those first three days. And then on day four, God replaced that temporary light source with a permanent light bearer. And uh, it, it, so other, other things here he said, too, that um, it just struck me as odd. He says, young earths say that maybe God gathered the light into the sun on day four. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone that believes that. Uh, I'm inclined to think that God, whatever God was doing for the first three days to provide that light, he just stopped doing that. And then on day four, he creates the sun, turns it on. The sun replaces that temporary light source. I guess God could gather light into the sun. God can yeah. do that. But uh, he says, and he says the composition of the moon is not the same as the sun. That's true. I'm not sure how it's remotely relevant, but the Bible doesn't say otherwise. The Bible doesn't say the moon and the sun are of the same substance or of the same composition. They're, they're not. Um, he says you cannot, this was interesting, he says you cannot gather light together to make this, the moon. And my first reaction was, no, you can't gather light together to make the moon. God can do what he wants. Okay. But not that I believe that. Uh, uh, but the, the moon may, the, God may have made the moon from nothing. He may have made it from previous material. We don't know. But it was made on day four. We know that because that's in, that's in the text. And uh, he says the moon only reflects light from the sun. That's, and I think he's therefore thinking, well, therefore, it's not really a light. And if, if so, then that's a semantic anachronism fallacy. Because maybe today we would say in order to qualify as a light, something has to emit light. But in Hebrew, that's not the case. Some, if something reflects light uh, very brightly, it's, it's considered a light. That's fine. The moon reflects light. It's a light. Therefore, the planets reflect light, but they're still considered lights. They're part of the lights that are made on day four. They're part of the kokavim, the stars that are made on day four, because planets are stars under the biblical system, the Hebrew system. Okay. So, uh, the, yeah, the Hebrew word for lights, moorth. Uh, includes things that shine by reflected light as well. So there's no problem there. Okay. All right. Very good. Also, you just cannot separate the sun into pieces and have the same resulting chemistry necessary to provide sunlight for plants, supposedly created on day three. This whole response from Young Earth creationists is simply. Oh, I had a quick question. So yeah. when you say that all you need is a light source. Mm -hmm and a rotating planet uh -huh. that it doesn't even mean that doesn't even mean you need to know what that light source is true it, that point is just to make that you're just making that point to show that it's not inconsistent to say that it's you know that you have night and day without the sun necessarily we don't have to know what that source is you know it, that's not a problem to not know what it is but just just to go to show that it's not impossible to have night and day right right without the light source of the rotating planet that'll do it okay all right contrived and ad hoc. A more likely explanation is the sun and moon are just elected to serve as signs for seasons and for days and years, instead of being materially created. And this is what Genesis 1 is actually saying. Number three, okay. Genesis one twenty eight. Okay. Uh, he, he makes a comment. I, I don't know what he means here. He says, also, you, you just cannot separate the sun into pieces and have the same resulting chemistry necessary to have sunlight for plants, supposedly created on day three. Um, the sun is fairly homogenous in terms of its chemistry. So you can't, any part of the sun that you remove is going to be the same as any other part in terms of the composition that right. gets hotter towards the core. So I don't, I don't know what he's saying there, but um, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand what problem there would be with God speaking the sun into existence, creating it pretty much like it is today, a little different because there's a little more helium in the core today because it's it's exhausted some of its fuel, but um, yeah, there's no pro there's there's no issue there that I can see. And um, plants, he talks about you know necessary for plants. Plants don't need sunlight to live; they just need light. You can grow plants indoors. You have, you have to have the right spectrum and so on, but you don't need the sun for plants. You just need light. And we had light for the first three days because God was providing it. So there's no problem with plants being created on day three and enjoying that temporary light source, which I would I would guess probably have the same spectrum that the sun does. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they're, they're absorbing that just fine. And then God replaces that temporary light with the uh, sun on day four. Maybe so the Hebrews would be less inclined to worship the sun because God's saying the sun's not the ultimate source of life. I'm the ultimate source of life. So he displaces the sun. It's not a deity. It's just an object that God created. A lot of other cultures worship the sun. The Egyptians worship the sun and so on. Uh, so God displaces it. Um, he talks about the plants supposedly created on day three. Well, 
that's what the Bible teaches. The plants were made on day three. Along with the- <laughs> like it, literally, it actually <laughs> says that on day three. <laughs> but, you know, um, I don't know. It, it just words like that make me think, you know, this, I wonder if this person has kind of a low view of scripture because when you start questioning the things the Bible just directly says, that's, 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 that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, you know, a natural reading of Genesis 1 makes perfect sense. There's no problem with astronomy. The, uh, there's no problem with that. Uh, God supplied the light for the first three days. Then he made a permanent light bearer and light bearers on day four. Uh, there's no problem there. He says a more likely explanation is the sun and moon are just elected to serve as signs and for seasons and for days and years. Uh, no, that's not what the text says. He didn't merely elect previously existing light sources. God can, God can do that. God can take people that previously exist and make disciples out of them, for example. And that's what the text says when, when God does that with disciples. But the Bible says that God made the lights, and that's in Genesis one uh, sixteen. He made the lights, asa, in, in the Hebrew, that's the root word. And the uh, the greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night, the stars also. So it specifies what those lights are. Each one is connected by a Hebrew uh, term called et, which connects the object of a verb back to the verb. And so the sun, the, moon, the greater light, the lesser light, God doesn't call them by name. So they're not deities, they're just objects and the stars also, uh, those are all made by God on day four. So there's no doubt from the text, if you take the text seriously, that, that they were made on day four. They weren't elected or appointed on day four. Sure. All right. Okay, let's go here. As noted before, young earth believers say before the fall, the earth was blissful and perfect with no death or suffering. But Genesis 1.28 suggests the opposite was true. Humanity is told to subdue the earth and have dominion over all animals. In Hebrew, these words are extremely harsh. The first word is used of war conquest and enslavement. The second word refers to ruling harshly over someone or oppression. So God is telling humans to make a warlike conquest on the earth because it needs subdued, implying the earth wasn't perfect and humanity was elected to transform the earth into a better place. But to do that meant tackling the harsh environments forcefully. The scholar Joshua John Van E notes the use of the second word for ruling over the animals seems to suggest humans had the right to use animals for any purpose, like food and clothing, implying they already had the right to kill and eat animals. But this means the command from God implies the earth was not a perfect, blissful creation. Instead, this verse implies the earth was chaotic and needed order brought to it. Also, humans seem to be given the right to kill animals, implying death was already in existence. Okay. Number two, bara. Okay. So, I mean, it seems to me, let me just start with the overall, the broad picture here, that the critic is suggesting that Genesis 128 might imply the opposite of what Genesis 131 directly states. And that's a problem. And what is directly stated in 1 Corinthians 15, 21? Okay. That's a hermeneutical error, a very basic one, because one of the first things you learn about hermeneutics is the explicit constrains the implicit. Okay, In other words, the clear statements of Scripture must be used to properly understand the less clear statements of Scripture, not the reverse. You don't take a word or phrase that has multiple meanings and just pick one that you like, ignoring the context, and then use that misunderstanding to reinterpret a very clear verse that really can't mean anything other than what it says. And so, uh, it, it, you know, the Bible says that God saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good before before sin entered the world. And so to say, well, yeah, but this other verse, you know, these words can be harsh and, well, they really aren't. Let's let's take a look at those words specifically. Sure. Uh, in Hebrew, he says in Hebrew, these words are very harsh. Um, well, let's take a look at that passage. It says, be fruitful and multiply. Nothing harsh there. Fill the earth as a result of multiplying. Nothing harsh there. And then there's the words and subdue it and have dominion over the animals. And the one that sounds harshest in English would be subdue. Uh, those are the two, and may, may maybe have dominion even or, or rule over the animals. People, you know, is that does that imply cruelty? Does that imply harsh? And the answer is no. Neither of those words is neither of those words are inherently harsh. Uh, subdue comes from the Hebrew word uh, kavash, and of course, even in English, subdue can mean to conquer because the the root meaning of subdue is to bring into order, to bring under your authority. Now you can do that harshly, but you don't have to do it harshly. Right. So uh, one one example of a harsh form of subduing would be conquering a nation, but that can't be the meaning in Genesis one. It can't be the main meaning because, or, yeah, Genesis one because there were no nations to conquer yet. That doesn't make sense. 
uh, that doesn't that doesn't fit the context of the passage. To bring under control is another uh, definition of subdue. That's a little more consistent. Interestingly, one of the definitions, if you look it up in the standard dip, uh, standard dictionary of subdue, is to bring land under cultivation. To bring land under cultivation. Now, does that fit the context? Sure does, especially when we look at Genesis 2 and we get more explicit instructions about what Adam's to do. God put Adam in the garden to work it and keep it, to cultivate it. And so that makes perfect sense. So I think that's probably what the verse is indicating when it says to subdue the earth. He's talking about cultivating it, bring plants under his authority. Uh, now, can you do that with animals too? Sure, he's the rule under the rule the animals. But again, that can be done in a uh, sinful, harsh way, or it can be done in a very godly way. So, the word itself doesn't imply harshness. It's it is used uh, in other places in Scripture. It it can again it can be used in warfare, which is harsh, but it can also be used in um, bringing someone or something under your authority. A servant would be brought under your authority, and of course, under biblical law, servants slaves were not allowed to be mistreated. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Bible forbids that. Uh, it's kind of like electricity, right? I mean, electricity is not harsh. It's not good or bad. It can be used for good or bad things. It can be used to power a hospital. It can be used to electrocute someone. You know, the, the substance itself is neither good or bad. It's how you use it. And so it's the same way with bringing something under authority. You can do that in a harsh way or in a gentle way. And, of course, when you're growing it with plants, how could that possibly be harsh? I mean, it, it, an arboretum is an example of people subduing the earth, and it's a great example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I like arboretums because it, it's kind of the way, it's what we were really originally supposed to do, you know, to bring, it's, it's God and man working together because man can organize where he plants the seeds, but only God can make them grow. And uh, I think that's just kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's, he says the second word, uh, to rule, to have dominion, refers to ruling harshly over someone with oppression. It just doesn't. The Hebrew word rada simply means to rule, to have mm -hmm. dominion. And again, you can do that in a good way or a harsh way. A good king rules his kingdom with compassion and justice. Some kings rule harshly, but that the, the word itself just means to rule. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the word is used of King Solomon, King Solomon's dominion in 1 Kings 4.24. That's rada. But so Solomon was a good and wise king, wisest man who ever lived, right? Psalm 72.8 applies, applies this to the Messiah. May he rule from sea to sea, he uses the same word, Rada. So does Jesus rule harshly? He has dominion, but he's not a harsh, he's not a harsh king. He's a good king. He rules with justice and with mercy. Uh, the critic says this seems to suggest that humans have the right to use animals for any purpose. I would say not any purpose, but yes, the word does mean that we can use animals for righteous purposes. Just as a good king rules his people, but he can also use his people to build cities and things like that. But he must treat them with justice and compassion. You can't treat them harshly. And it's the same with us over the animals. We can use oxen to plow fields. And, and I would I would cite this uh, verse in Genesis as giving us the right to do that. God gave us rule over the animals. We can use horses for transportation. We can do that. We can bring pets into our home just to love and have fun with. That's fine, uh, as long as they're treated with compassion. And in fact, the Bible says a righteous man has regard for the life of his animal. That's Proverbs 12:10. So we, we are to care for and we're to rule over them, but in a way that's compassionate and just. So there's nothing in that verse that suggests that the world was a harsh place or that it was cruel or that there was violence or death. None, none of that is in that passage. Hmm. Uh, critic goes on to say that we can use animals for any purpose like food and clothing, not before sin. That would have been cruel and outside the scope of our authority before sin. Uh, because, again, it would be cruel to kill, kill an animal for no purpose. You don't need that at that time. Uh, people still have to answer to God. We're, we're not the ultimate king of the earth. We're stewards. God's the ultimate king. And so we have to answer to him in the way in which we rule over the animals. We need to rule with justice and compassion. Now, after sin, God did prevent. I mean, he instituted animal death at the time of sin to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. And that told them what they could do then for the coming generations. And as those clothes were out, they'd have to kill animals to provide new clothing and so on. After sin, yes, you can kill an animal. You still don't want to do it in a needlessly cruel fashion, though. Sure. Right? So, and, and, all, and then what about eating them? Well, after the flood is the first time God gives people permission to eat meat. If you look at Genesis, originally human beings and animals were all vegetarian initially. And then we don't know when the animals became, uh, some of them became uh, carnivorous, but human beings were not permitted to eat meat until after the flood. Uh, so now we have permission from God to, to use animals in that way. So go ahead and enjoy that bacon. Uh, so that's fine. Praise the Lord. All right, good. <laughs> I was feeling conviction about it. I'm glad, I'm glad that we got that settled. 
All right. We're almost we're almost good. We're making better time than I thought because these things take time. So I, I appreciate it. You're doing a, a great job. Number two is not so much a passage, but the use of a Hebrew word. Many young earth creationists believe this word refers to God creating out of nothing. And it is used frequently throughout Genesis 1. But looking at how the word is used outside of Genesis 1 implies bara doesn't necessarily mean creation out of nothing. It might not even refer to material creation at all. John Walton has done a full semantic analysis on the word, and he points out the word never necessarily means creation out of nothing. And there are several times it cannot mean that. In Psalm 51, the author uses para to ask God to make a new clean heart within him. This obviously doesn't refer to the creation of a new material heart out of nothing. In Isaiah 65, it refers to electing Jerusalem to be a place of joy. In Isaiah 43, it refers to creating the nation of Israel, pause it there. which came okay. about over time and through now. So it, this, in a way, is a non-starter because it, uh, I'm not committed one way or another as to whether or not bara has to mean, in all cases, to create out of nothing. Okay. Uh, some creationists believe that others don't, so that's not we're not unified on that front. So it's a little bit of a red herring fallacy. And it's not really relevant, uh, strongly relevant to creation, because the first thing that God created would have to be made out of nothing, just logically. So now I think a case could be made. I have read cases made that bara is God speaking something into existence that has no previous existence. That's its literal meaning. And when I look at Genesis, in all instances, I can see that fits. There aren't any obvious um, uh, places where it wouldn't in, in Genesis, for example. So the, the real the real question is not what is the range of the word bara, which is the issue he's getting into, but rather what does it mean in the context of Genesis 1? Now, I mean, there's nothing wrong with examining what it means in other contexts. That's fine. That might help you constrain it in Genesis 1. But we don't want to commit this fallacy of saying, well, this word can mean something in this context over here. Therefore, it must mean that in this context here. Hermeneutics doesn't work that way. It's, that's an unwarranted expansion of an expanded semantic field to, to change, you know, to allow meanings that do not fit the context, even though the word could mean that in a different context. Sure. So, um, uh, so John Walton apparently says that he points out the word never necessarily means creation out of nothing. I would take issue with that. In Genesis 1-1, the creation of heaven and earth in the beginning must have been out of nothing. Why? Logic. <laughs> because it was in the beginning. Uh, the, the first things that God creates, the first thing that God created has to be made out of nothing because there was nothing else to make it out of. And so it would have to be that in the context of Genesis 1-1. Uh, the only alternative would be you have some other eternal substance, co-eternal with God, that made God made the universe from that. And that would be heretical because God alone is uh, eternal. Now, so, you would, would you agree with Dr. Walton that the word doesn't necessarily mean that? Would you agree with that but say, given Genesis 1, though, it seems to strongly suggest that that is the case? Yeah, I, I'm saying I'm not I'm not uh, committed one way or another as to whether or not bara has to mean okay. uh, create out of nothing, but it does have to mean that in Genesis 1. And that's the issue. That's that's the issue that we're going, you know, that we're going with here. So it's fine to discuss what it means in other contexts, but to then try to import that into Genesis 1, it's not going to do that. And I would say that there are no clear examples in Scripture of bara being used in its literal sense to mean anything other than creation out of nothing. There's, there's, no, there's no verse where it necessarily has another meaning. Now, several have been brought up here, but all of these are examples from poetic sections of Scripture where the word is being used in a poetic sense. Uh, it, it, this, the verse that's on the screen right now, Isaiah 43, uh, 1, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Created and formed. Those are synonyms because they both, you know, bringing something into existence. Jacob and Israel, those are two different names for the same person. So you can see that parallelism there. Mm. Created me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. They go together. Clean heart, yeah, or yeah, right spirit, clean heart go together. And uh, create and renew go together. They're not exactly the same, but they go together. And so you can't then take, you know, words in a poetic section where they can be used in a non-literal sense and then try to import that non-literal meaning back into historical narrative where they're meant to be um, meant to be taken literally. Mm. And so, you know, he's, he's basically trying to say, see, it doesn't, it doesn't have to mean literally create out of nothing in these poetic sections. I agree, but that's true of all words. <laughs> Any yeah. word it can take on a non-literal meaning in poetry, you know, tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. 
That doesn't mean that tigers literally burn. That's, we can't say, well, you know, that's burning is therefore a property of a tiger. No, because you can't take poetry and apply it literally like that. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And even here, you know, cre you know, create in me a clean heart. Even that is consistent with the literal meaning of the word, because we know he's not talking about the physical heart anyway. He's talking about the core of our being. And there are other passages where God doesn't transform our heart so much as remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. So, you know, that he's made out of nothing. So even there, it's not, it's not necessarily meaning yeah. out of nothing. But I will grant that in poetic literature, words can take on all sorts of non-literal meanings that has no relevance to what the word means in historical narrative, particularly in the context of Genesis 1-1. Hmm. I'm seeing some confusion in the in the comments here. It it may be the case, and I don't want to speak for Michael Jones, but it, um, I I do believe he believes in creation ex nihilo. He <laughs> may just he may just think it's not being necessarily taught in Genesis one. That's I think that's probably his position. I'd have to double check that. So same thing with John Walton. I think John Walton, uh, who he relies heavily upon, believes in creation ex nihilo, but thinks that Genesis one is not necessarily talking about that because of the reasons he gives, um, sure. saying that it's more functional as opposed to you know creating you know uh, new matter. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's uh, we're almost done here. You're doing an excellent job, Dr. Lyle. Thanks. And uh, are are you having fun? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. There we go. Natural processes. In Ezekiel 21, it refers to making a sign. It is even used to refer to David not eating food. There are times it could refer to material creation out of nothing, but it never necessarily does. And there are clear examples where Barah cannot refer to material creation. So there is no reason to assume that that is the meaning in Genesis 1 especially given the previous problems that we have gone over. Kenneth Matthews notes Barah more likely refers to bringing about activity rather than material manufacturing, implying Genesis 1 is not about material creation. Before okay. we get to number one, remember to subscribe and hit the... Okay. So I, I noticed a mistake in 2 Samuel... 1217, that's not an instance of bara, actually. It's a similar word. It's bara. Yeah. It's very similar, but it's not the right word. <laughs> okay. You yeah, made a mistake there, but we all make mistakes. That's fine. Um, it seems to me that all, all he's really demonstrated in this section is that non-literal sections of scripture can use words non-literally. Mm -hmm. But I don't dispute that. Um, he says, so there's no reason to assume that that's the meaning of Genesis 1. Well, yes, there is. Context and logic. Context and logic. Context, uh, Genesis 1, historical narrative, frequent use of the law of consecutive. That's the way Jews recorded their history. So there's no doubt that that's what it's referring to is literal history. It, um, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. Bara. It's, that's, that's the word that he uses. And he's, you know, well, to, he says it, couldn't, it, it doesn't necessarily mean to make out of nothing. I would take issue with that in Genesis 1. It has to mean to make out of nothing there because it's the first thing that God created. If it wasn't, then it wouldn't be the beginning. Right? If God created something you know, billions of years ago and then finally got around and then changed that into heaven and earth, then it wouldn't be in the beginning that God made, created or made heaven and earth. It would be the much later. That's not what the text says. It's in the beginning that God created the heaven and the earth. So it's at the start of time. Uh, that indicates that it's the first thing or first things God created, heaven and earth. And so logically, the first thing that God makes has to be made out of nothing because it, otherwise it wouldn't be the first thing that God made. And so just from logic, we can see that in Genesis 1.1, logic and hermeneutics, we can see that in that, in that instance, Bara would have to mean to make out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's confirmed in other scriptures where, you know, the, the, we, we know that the worlds were not made out of things which appear, which are visible. They're, they're made out of nothing. It's consistent. God calls those things into existence that had no previous existence. That's a consistent theme throughout scripture. I'm not going to uh, debate whether or not Baral has to mean that in all instances. That's that's not a dial hill issue for me, but it does mean that in Genesis 1-1, and that's the important one for this this conversation. All right. I have motion sensors, so the light... Okay, there we go. I had to oh. move my chair. That's <laughs> in the dark. All right, let's continue. Notification bell. So you are updated when new videos are coming out. We have several videos on archaeological evidence for the life of Abraham to the Exodus coming out over the next few months. So hit the bell and stay updated to know when these videos are published.
And now finally, number one, Genesis 1, verse 1. This may come as a shock to you, but the very first verse of the Bible can create difficulties for young Earth models. The reason is, over the past few decades, scholars have noted the first verse lacks a definite article in Hebrew. So the way we translate it may not be accurate. Instead, scholars like John Salhammer and Robert Holmstead have argued it would make more sense to translate it as when God began to create the heavens and the earth. What this would mean is verse 1 is no longer a complete sentence, but what we would call a dependent clause in an incomplete sentence. So this would mean verse 1 is dependent on the following clause, which is in verse 2. So Genesis is really saying, when God began to bara the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. In other words, when God started baraing the heavens and the earth, it was already there as formless and void. So many scholars note this implies Genesis 1 is not about bringing the universe and the earth into existence for the first time, but is about God transforming the earth from a chaotic state into an ordered state. If the Hebraic form of verse 1 and 2 implies the earth was already there existing before the creation week, then the text supports an extended period of time prior to this and is not actually stating the absolute beginning point of our universe. Now I know some of these points might come as a shock to you, Pause that. but we are not arguing this creates. Okay. Is that, is that, and I think he ends there, right? Yeah, I think so. So there's nothing more to, to listen to at that point. I'm going to remove that and get us both some, uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So, um, he says the first verse lacks a definite article in Hebrew. That's true. I'll come back to what that means. I uh, says so the way we translate it may not be accurate. And one thing I do want to point out, because I, I don't think he's remotely right in anything he said here, other than I think it is legitimate for people to go back and, and ask the question, has that word or phrase been translated correctly? Because I'm not claiming that any particular modern English translation is infallible. I'm claiming the, the original Hebrew and te text that God inspired is infallible. So that's fine. We need to go back and check that. But I do have to say, if if every major English translation of scripture translates the word or phrase exactly the same way, that's a pretty good indication that it's been translated properly. Because okay. the, people, the people that translated the Bible, these are no dummies. These are people that they can read Hebrew and Greek as better than I can read English. These are, sure. these are scholars. And while an individual translation might get some, there, there are some translations where they, they, they differ on how the verse should be translated. Those are the ones that you look into and you say, okay, where do I come down on this? Maybe look, look at the text. And usually it's not easy. Otherwise, they would have all come down on the issue the same way. But uh, when somebody comes along and says, no, all, all the Bible translations have been getting this wrong for millennia, that raises an immediate red flag. That's an indication that, no, you probably don't, you probably don't know Hebrew or logic as well as you think you do. Hmm. The, uh, now, to the issue here, the, the definite article, that's a word like the in, in English language, right? So the dog, that refers to a definite example of a dog. So that's the definite article. A dog would be, uh, the word a would be an indefinite article. And uh, Hebrew has a uh, Hebrew has the definite article, and it's it's like the letter H in English, so it's just a little ha in front of in front of the word. So uh, shamayim is heaven, so ha shamayim would be the heavens. Okay. The heavens. And um, so and Hebrew has no indefinite article. So a lot of times when a verse is translated, if there's no definite article, you think well, it's probably it should be translated a whatever. And I've heard people argue that he didn't, our, our critic here didn't quite argue that way, but I have heard people argue that Genesis 1 should be translated in a beginning because the definite article is not there. And uh, I understand that, but it, it's not accurate. The, the word for beginning is reshith in Hebrew. And the thing you need to understand is that even though it, it, it doesn't have the definite article in front of it, it's always used in a definite sense in scripture. Hebrew, the Hebrew language is not the same as English, and there are places in Hebrew where you have a, the definite article there, hot whatever, the, the whatever, that in English it sounds awkward, and so English translations remove it. And there are other places where definiteness is, is indicated, but the word the is not, or the, the Hebrew equivalent, ha, is not there, and yet we add it in English to make sense. And so I would argue that the translators have translated Genesis 1-1 correctly. It really does mean in the beginning, because Reshith, whenever it's used in Scripture, it always has, it, in every instance I could find, it always has definiteness to, us, to mm -hmm. it. Uh, Reshith in Scripture never has 
a huh in front of it. It never has the definite article attached. And yet it's always translated the beginning in every single instance. And I'll give you some examples here. Jeremiah 26.1, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, that's Reshith without the definite article. In fact, it's Bereshith because the Hebrew word for in, like in the beginning, would be but. You just attach it to the front of the word. So Bereshith means in the beginning. It's exactly the same as in uh, Genesis 1.1. Now, could that mean in a beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim? Uh, no, that wouldn't make any sense because he reigned once. So it's it's the beginning of his reign, mm. one beginning. Uh, so that, that wouldn't make any sense. Jeremiah 27, 1, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah. It's Bereshit. Uh Jeremiah 28, 1, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, again. Uh, again, it's Bereshith. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's Reishi. It does not have the definite article in front of it. Should, should it just be a beginning of wisdom? No, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's been properly translated. And likewise, Genesis 1, 1 is properly translated. Gray sheep never has the definite article in Hebrew, but when translated to English, it always does. And that, that's the only way that would make sense. Mm. So, um, so then he goes on to then to say it would make sense to translate it as when God began to create the heavens and the earth. I'm sorry, but that's just wrong. Uh, Bray sheep means in the beginning. That's the way it, it, it's translated to English. That's what it means. Uh, if you wanted to say when God began, it would be uh, ki hekel Elohim. Ki hekel Elohim. Totally different construction. That's how you would say when God began. And that's that's used in, in passages like Genesis 6-1, when men began to multiply. That's that's the way it's phrased there. Mm -hmm. So, um, And by the way, if, you, if even if it were phrased that way, uh, you know, ki hekel Elohim, uh, it wouldn't be bara after that, right? It wouldn't be when God began created. It would be when God began to create. Bara would be in the infinitive form, at least in English, and I think in Hebrew as well. Okay. Although I admit your verb forms are hard, but bara is in the it's in the call perfect form. It's not to it's not in the beginning. It's not when God began to create. It's in the beginning God created. That's really what the words mean in Hebrew. And uh, he says that would make Genesis one an incomplete sentence. In some sense, it's it's moot to talk about that because that's just not the way. It's not what the words mean in the Hebrew language. Mm. Uh, he says requiring verse two to complete the clause. Uh, no, because then it wouldn't have the and in front of it. And the earth was without form and void in the beginning. When God began to create the heaven and the earth, the earth was without. There wouldn't be an and there. And the earth was without form. Uh, in fact, the verse two is using a what's called a vav consec or vav disjunctive, and that's where you have and followed by a non verb. And that indicates that it's commenting on what happened previously. Normally in Hebrew, the verb comes first and then the noun. But if you want to comment on something that just happened, you can you can flip that, especially if the noun was mentioned previously, to keep the focus on, in this case, the earth. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth, it's kind of like what we use parentheses for in English. Verse mm -hmm. 2 is describing the conditions that existed when God first created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so it's a parenthetical comment. That's what verse two is. It's not the completion of a sentence. It's and, and then it gives additional information to tell us what the earth looked like when, when God first created it. Before he formed and filled it, it was formless and void. Hmm. So, um, so he says, so Genesis is really saying when God began to bara the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. In other words, when, when God started baraing the heavens and the earth, it was already there as formless and void. Uh, that's just not what the text says. There, there is a way to say that in Hebrew. If that's what God had intended to say, he could say that. And I gave the example of how you would say that in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So um, it really was in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, not billions of years later. And uh, he goes on to say, if the Hebrew form of verse 1 and 2 implies the earth was already there, existing before the creation week, then the text supports an extended period of time prior to this. Now, it doesn't follow. Even if you were right about that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't demand millions of years, would it? He, he, at best, it would allow for it, but I would say that even that is not allowed in the text because there are many passages that confirm the recent origin of the universe. Remember in Mark 10, 6, when Jesus said from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He's referring to the creation of Adam and Eve and puts that at the beginning, which makes sense because they were there on the first week. Some people say, well, it wasn't the first instant. I think the first week counts as the beginning. But if it was millions of years later, that wouldn't make any sense at all. He's referring to the creation of, you know, the beginning of creation, he says. So he specifies that. Uh, Romans 1.20, Paul argues that people have no excuse to suppress the knowledge of God because they have seen his power in nature since the creation of the world. 
Okay, and that wouldn't be true if the world were created billions of years ago. People would only recently have had access to that. But in fact, people have a had access to the creation since the sixth day of creation when the world was still being created, albeit at the end of that creation week. So not billions of years later. So I just encourage people to, you know, to, to, I, I hope you can see what's going on here. I think if you just, if you read the Bible naturally, if you read it in the way Jesus and the apostles took the scriptures, they took, they took them as history, they took the historical sections as history. They took the Psalms as Psalms. We should do the same. And, you know, if you're going to believe the gospels, if you're going to believe a man can rise from the dead, you might as well go ahead and believe the Bible when it talks about the creation of the universe. Why not? You're going to be made fun of either way. So why not stand on <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. All right. Well, you've given a lot of a lot to chew on. And I, I, as I tell people all the time, I listen to my own podcast because I have to sometimes I'm like navigating multiple things. And so I have to go back and listen so I can get all the, the, the nuggets. But, uh, do, do you have a few minutes to take a couple of questions? I don't, sure. I, okay. So, uh, we'll, we'll get some of the, these, this is quick. You could answer it quick and then we move on so that we can get through, uh, uh, you know, more questions than if we were to give more in depth, but I'm going to do some super chat ones because they were nice enough to, to give uh, a couple of bucks. I appreciate that. Jason, what's the difference? He has these Hebrew. <laughs> I don't know if you could read that. I, I can't be, let me see if I can enlarge it a little bit. Okay. I read a little bit of Hebrew, but you're a bit, taking a visual test. Right now. Cover your left eye. Cover oh. your left. <laughs> so, uh, but okay. So that's Bereshit and okay. It's, it's just a vowel pointing that's different. Okay. So um, the vowel pointing is different on the on the ba. One and the other one it lacks the degesh. So it would be va, va um, I'm not familiar with the. Well, <laughs> I'm reading right to left because Hebrew is right to left. So this what would be the second term? So I can't tell you. Sorry about that. I, I don't know. No, the, no worries. No the, worries. That difference. Reishit itself just means beginning. And normally you put the beat. You you put the base right. You detach it to it. That's the way it is in scripture. There's no space there. So it would be attached mm -hmm. to it. All right. And thank you for that question. Uh, here's another question. To what extent did the early church fathers understand young earth creationism? Thanks for coming, Dr. Lyle. Hi, Eli. Yeah, I re recently I actually did some uh, articles on that. So you might want to look on our, our website, if you don't mind a shameless promotion there, biblicalscienceinstitute.com, because uh, uh, Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales, had made some comments about uh, young earth creation. He seemed to think that it was a very recent aberration from what the Bible teaches, but but uh, no, the early church fathers were, I won't say completely unified, but it, it was certainly the dominant position throughout church history until 1700s, 1800s, uh, the, um, and, and it was mainly from uh, geologists who began importing the philosophies of uniformitarianism into their interpretations of the rock layers that said, well, they're, they're really, this can't be done by one flood. It had this happened gradually over millions of years. Uh, people be then began to come up with things like the, the day age theory and the gap theory. Yeah, those are those are fairly recent, though. The gap theory in particular is the 1800s. It, people mm -hmm. didn't believe that before that, where there's a, supposedly a gap between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Sure. Uh, no, throughout church history, the, the majority of people believed in uh, a recent creation. Even folks like Augustine, who, who didn't take Genesis entirely literally, he still believed in a world that's less than 6,000 years old. And mm -hmm. I have a quote from him. To that effect. So it, it, that was the dominant position. You will find one or two here or there that that wanted to argue for the uh, the Greek philosophy because Greek it, the Greek thinking influenced the church and the Greeks believed in an old earth. So you'll find a little bit of that, but it wasn't common until 1700s, 1800s. All right, very good. Um, James asks, uh, is Dr. Lyle a Hebrew scholar? Because major Hebrew scholars wouldn't say that IP, that's inspiring philosophy, uh, they wouldn't say that what he said is totally wrong with regards to the possibility of certain words having the meanings that he suggested. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. No, I, I have the joy of knowing Hebrew scholars. I know Stephen Boyd personally. He's a PhD <laughs> in Hebrew. And so if you have uh, questions about that, I rely a lot on his information. So if you have specific questions on a specific nuance of a Hebrew term, I suggest you look up Stephen Boyd, especially his chapter in the rate book, which is just wonderful. That's where he analyzes the verb forms in Genesis 1 and shows that it is undeniably historical narrative. It's not, it, mm -hmm. and therefore it should be interpreted literally. It's not a uh, poem or anything like that. Okay. Stephen Boyd. All right. Well, I had a question. Someone asked it a while back and I can't find it, but I'm interested in this. And then we'll wrap things up because I want to respect your time, which I feel like I've disrespected your time. We went so long, but as long as you don't mind, I don't mind it. I'm learning a lot as well. Um, someone mentioned with regards to the global flood that if the flood was global, how did the Nephilim, how were the Nephilim in existence after the flood? 
would that would it would it not be the case that they were destroyed prior to the flood? Yeah, they were Nephilim. Nephilim. Well, there's there's some debate about that word. That's the Hebrew word. There's some debate about what it means. Okay. It's similar to a, the Hebrew word for to fall. So it might mean fallen ones. Uh, some people think they were angel human hybrids. I, I don't. I, I stay away from that interpretation. I think that the uh, Nephilim. The, the bottom line is the Nephilim that existed before the flood were different Nephilim than existed after the flood. That's that's the answer. They didn't survive. They okay. were killed. And then new people were born. And I, I think the feeling were just human beings that fell away from the faith. And so that word is applied for those unbelievers in the Old Testament and those or, uh, before the flood, pardon me, and also those that came about after the flood. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was uh, this was awesome. <laughs> Very okay. informative, guys. If you appreciate uh, what Dr. Lyle had to say, I would strongly um, I would strongly suggest that you support his ministry. I mean, it takes money to and time to do the things that he does. And so I'm sure he'd greatly appreciate if you go over to his website, uh, biblicalscienceinstitute.com um, and support, um, whether it's just taking in the content or financial support, uh, that'd be very much appreciative. One last word with regards to how we should interact with one another on this topic. I do see a lot of contention on this topic. Um, it is okay to passionately disagree, um, but uh, you need to do that in a way that is itself consistent with scripture. We need to be able to talk about these things without necessarily um, judging someone's motives. I see people, you know, sometimes saying someone like, you know, Michael Jones, like, oh, well, he's just trying to do A, B, and C. Let's not attack the person. Let's actually take his arguments and interact with them like Dr. Lyle tried to do. And if you disagree with Dr. Lyle, address his arguments. That That's how we should be doing it instead of um, attacking the person. Um, because that keeps lines of communication open and you have fruitful discussion as a result. So I just want to encourage uh, folks to uh, to approach this topic in that fashion. All right, well, with that said, um, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was excellent and I learned so much and I'm gonna go back and listen to this. And folks, if you um, like this discussion um, or rather this commentary rather, uh, share this video uh, to those who you think um, are interested also in this topic, they might find it useful as well. And um, thank you so much for listening. That's all for this episode. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.